We are at lecture 45 in the middle of um, 8.4 in the textbook. Um, so I'm kind of excited actually about what I'm going to do after this class, that I'm moving a lot of my stuff from Harrelson Hall, which is a tired old building that I think is literally making me sick through the ventilation system, to the brand new building over there where old Riddick Stadium used to be across from Poe Hall. So at about 11.30 today, more than half my stuff will be in the back of my son's pickup and moving into the new offices. If you get a chance to walk in over there, it's really, really a nice building. So hopefully you'll get a uh, class in that building before you graduate. It's very, very nice. I don't think it has a name yet. I have an idea what the name will be uh, based on one of the donors, but uh, it doesn't have a name yet. Officially, what do you think it'll be? Uh, the Griggs Hall. No, no. <laughs> I, if it were based on my donors, the the building would fit on this desk. Um, but someone else who has big, deep pockets gave uh, a lot of money, and I think it eventually will be named after that man or his company, which would be deserving. Is it true they're tearing down Harrison Hall? The plan for Harrelson. Um, we still need the classroom space because our new building doesn't have nearly the classroom space you would guess when you look at it because it's a big building, but it's a lot. there's a lot of offices. Mathematics will be over there and statistics in that new building. Uh, and so everybody's offices in that, those entire departments will be there, including their graduate students. So there are some, there's a big auditorium uh, classroom that seats about 250, and there are several that seat in the 80s some in the 40s, but we can't give up Harrelson yet. So I think the plan is to keep Harrelson active and used um, over the next five years or so, and then um, gradually, like I think next year, possibly the third floor of Harrelson will be closed off. And then eventually when we've got enough classroom space, the second floor, and then the first floor, and then the ground floor things down there. So they'll phase it out and then eventually probably level it. Yeah, that's uh, built in 1963. Um, it's unique, but it's, uh, it's just strange for a math classroom. Okay, so let's um, start with what we left off with, hopefully not the coughing fit, but the content that was surrounding the math that led to the coughing fit. We looked at this problem and I don't want to redo this one, I want to come up with another one that might actually get us to a, a reasonable error. So we wanted the sum of this one accurate to three decimal places and we were kind of searching for that term that would not affect the third decimal place and then that's basically the first term that is not included, so we would add all the terms together until we get to that point. So that one took quite a while to get there, and there's another one that I want us to look at because I want to get factorial in a problem before we use factorials in the ratio test. So let's say instead of n cubed in the bottom, let's say we have n factorial. And I think we'll see things getting there a little bit faster than we saw them getting there here as far as the level of accuracy that we want. So it is alternating. Uh, let's go ahead while we're kind of reviewing some things. Let's see if this converges. I think probably not a doubt that it does converge with 1 over n factorial. But let's go through the two-part test just to review. What's the first piece of that two-part test? Alternating series test. Okay, is it ultimately decreasing? So is the n plus first term smaller in magnitude? So we're ignoring the alternating part. So the n plus first term with the kind of the definition of what the value of the term is, disregarding the alternating signs, would be 1 over n plus 1 factorial. I'll put a question mark above this. 
is that smaller than 1 over n factorial? It is. Larger denominator, smaller fraction, so that's true. Um, the, part of the reason I wanted to get factorial in a problem. <coughs> so I want to write out in a second what n plus 1 factorial is. If you had to write out what n factorial is, how would you write that out? Okay, and let's throw that in reverse. So let's... <coughs> So the largest one is n, right? And then we multiply n by n minus 1, n minus 2, back to 1, right? What's 1 factorial? Would be 1 times every integer that precede, that comes after it all the way back to 1. Well, it's already there. What's 0 factorial? It's 1 by definition, okay? If it were not... One by definition, we have some problems down the road. So, not that we get zero factorial very often, but it occasionally it comes up. All right, so there's n factorial. n plus one factorial should be n plus one times n times n minus one, all the way back to one. So, could we say that n plus one factorial? is really n plus 1, what is this? N factorial. Times n factorial. So we'll need that in the problem before we're finished today. But clearly this denominator is bigger than this denominator, therefore the value of the fraction is smaller. So there's part 1. Uh, what else do we need? The limit of the value of the term other than the alternating signs way out there to the right. Is that zero? Is that fraction yes. one over n factorial as n gets larger and larger yes. get closer and closer to zero? Yes. yes. So it is convergent by the alternating series test. Suppose we wanted to, let's go back to that same level of accuracy, we wanted to sum accurate <coughs> to three decimal places. So it is convergent by the alternating series test. So the question is, can we find the sum accurate to three decimal places? So we don't have to search quite so far with this one. because factorials get there a lot quicker than something cubed, which is what we had yesterday. So the first term is positive. Then we'll alternate signs from there. First term is what? 1. Next term, minus 1 over 2 factorial, which is 1 over 2. Probably should have done this example yesterday instead of the one we did. The, the search is a little more confined. Back to positive, 1 over 3 factorial, which is 1 over 6. Back to minus, 1 over 4 factorial. 4 factorial is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1, 24. 5 factorial, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, and a product, 120. 6 factorial, 6 times 120, 720. They're getting the, getting larger. The denominator is getting larger faster than the cubed values yesterday. Um, 5 factorial, 6 factorial, 7 factorial. 7 times 720. 50, 40. And we could find more. I think we're good. So we want accurate to three decimal places. Uh, is there a possibility that we are there? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's check this one out. What's the value of the six term? I don't care if it's positive or negative. What's 1 over 720? Not good enough yet, right? 
because we want accurate to three decimal places, I think that value, as we decided yesterday, would in fact affect the third decimal place. I'm sure we're going to get it here. What's 1 over 50, 40? 198. So if we use this term, the seventh term, as our error term, it looks like we're going to get the level of accuracy we want. So if this becomes our error term, then we want the sum of the first six, right? The sum of the first six, let me see if I jotted that down, 0.368. So we would want those six terms added together. Somebody can check that out, but I, that's what I have written down. And that is accurate to the third decimal place because the next value, if we would add it in, is this value, which would not affect the third decimal place. So the sum is 0.368 accurate to three decimal places. So we might have some changes, but they're going to occur in the decimal places beyond the third. That's a little cleaner, more searchable example than we had yesterday, plus I wanted to get factorial in there. Uh, another thing that we're going to need in a problem before we finish today. Questions on this before we leave this? Are you checking that out, Katie, to see if .368 is right? Didn't get it. Okay. Yeah, that's not right. Uh, the point three six eight can't be right. So let's. I'm checking it out because one is too large, right? Then we subtract a half, which we always end up subtracting too much. So we then we get the sum of the first two is a half. So the sum is actually between one and a half, so that can't be right. What'd you get? Six? Six, three, two. Six, three, two. I don't know where that came from. Let's get rid of it. Got that, too? Okay. Thank you. Thanks for checking that out. Um, another problem we're going to encounter besides n plus one factorial we're going to have a problem that has n to the n in it. And then we're going to be talking about the next term. Well, the next term would be n plus 1 raised to the n plus 1. So it's to our advantage to simplify a little bit n plus 1 raised to the n plus 1. Isn't that And it might not be exactly clear where we're headed with this, but is this a legitimate equation? Is n plus 1 raised to the n plus 1 the same thing as n plus 1 times n plus 1 to the n? Same thing, right? Because this would be to the first. We'd have the same base in a product, two things. In a product situation with the same base, we could add the exponents. So we'd add the 1 and the n, and we're right back to where we started. So that's something else we're going to encounter in a problem um, that we need to solve before the class is over today. All right, next topic in 8.4, after the alternating series test, and how can we approximate a certain number of terms in an <coughs> infinite alternating series, and what? how do we guess at the error or the remainder uh, is absolute convergence. And it is, what the name says it is, is that it's not only is the series under consideration, which might be alternating convergent, so is the version that is not alternating. So it's absolute value. So we're really kind of considering, in a sense, we're considering two series at the same time, the one that alternates and the one that does not alternate. So here's an example of an uh, absolute convergence problem.
if it converges and its absolute value converges, we say it is absolutely convergent. So we're really considering this one and this one, in a sense, simultaneously. If the non-alternating version converges, wouldn't it make sense that the alternating version also converges? We can take a series that its non-alternating version does not converge, but yet its alternating version does converge. What's an example of that? 1 over n. We've already done that. 1 over n by itself, not alternating, is the harmonic series, which diverges. The alternating harmonic, in fact, converges. So this is kind of the one we have to check. If this one is convergent, clearly the alternating series will also be convergent. But there is a possibility that, that they could differ in solution. So what about 1 over n to the fourth, the non-alternating version? converges, not because I say so or you say so, it's P-series, P is 4, so the absolute value of P is greater than 1 or greater than or equal to 1? Greater than. Greater than. If it were 1, then we'd have 1 over n to the 1, which is harmonic, so we want it greater than 1. So if the P series, P is 4, the absolute value of P is greater than 1, then we know it converges. If this one converges, its alternating version will automatically converge. So this is a series that is absolutely convergent. Now we could go through the test. Is the n plus first term less than or equal to the nth term? Yes, larger denominator, smaller fraction. And is the limit as n goes to infinity, is it zero? Well, it doesn't have to be zero because this one would not have converged if the limit were not zero. In fact, if the limit were not zero, we'd say this one diverges, right? Which is one of the tests for divergence. So you can see if this one is convergent, Clearly, this one has got to be convergent. How could it go to zero if it were not ultimately decreasing? That'd be kind of tough to do. And there's no way the limit could be zero if, in fact, this one did not converge. So once you get this one, you're automatic on this one. So that one as a first example. As a second example, one that we just talked about, The alternating harmonic compared to the harmonic itself. So let's look at this one, harmonic, therefore divergent. We've val validated that for three really good reasons, but that's enough. But because this one was not convergent, we kind of have to test this one separately. We've already tested this one. Um, 1 over n plus 1 less than the predecessor. Yes. Is the limit of the nth term 0 as n works its way out there to the right? Yes. So by the alternating series test, this one is convergent. This one we determined is divergent. So is this series absolutely convergent? No. It is not. So if the positive term series is convergent, automatically the alternating one is convergent. But if this one is not, we can check the other one separately. But clearly already it's not absolutely convergent. All right, the bulk of what we need to spend our time on today is the ratio test, which is another test for convergence. And we will use this not only as a test to determine if a given series that doesn't have any variables in it 
is convergent or divergent, but we're also going to use it when we have <laughs> variables in it, as in a Maclaurin series or a Taylor series, that have x's in there, under what conditions would one like that be convergent, or when would it be divergent? So we'll use the ratio test in, in the rest of this chapter quite a bit. So here's how it's going to go. We're going to compare the values of the n plus first term in quotient form. So we want to divide these two. The n plus first term divided by its predecessor. We don't care if they were alternating or not because we're going to dispense with that. We're going to take the absolute value. And we want to see what happens to this quotient way out to the right. What is the n plus first term divided by its predecessor? So you can see why it's called the ratio test. Ratio of the n plus first term divided by the nth term. And we're going to get an answer out. Now, I bet you you can tell me what's going to happen based on what we get for L. So let's say L is smaller than 1. What does that say about the value of the n plus first term compared to the value of the nth term as we work our way way out to the right? That this one is bigger than this one, right? So if the top is smaller than the bottom, that means that the terms, in a sense, are getting smaller as we go way out to the right. So if they're getting smaller in this fashion, now granted, this is not a catch-all kind of test. We're not going to, if that happens, to the point where it's distinguishable way out to the right as n approaches infinity, that's going to be good enough to determine convergence. And you say, well, what, what about the harmonic? What if we did the harmonic? Well, we'll do that one, and we'll show that this test isn't good enough to determine if it converges or diverges. So you've got to at least trust the fact that if the limit is less than 1, it's convergent. If the limit is greater than 1, what's that say about the n plus first term compared to its predecessor? Top. Top's bigger than the bottom. And that's not a good sign for convergence if their terms are getting a little bit larger as we go. And you can tell which value we've left out. Greater than 1, less than 1. What about if the limit is 1? That means that the n plus first term is, for all practical purposes, exactly the same as the nth term. We can't. We don't know. We can't make a decision. In this case, the ratio test fails to give us a conclusion. So they're basically they're indistinguishable. One, they might be getting slightly smaller, but it's not enough to say that there's a distinguishable difference between the n plus first term and the nth term. Hopefully that stuff really makes a lot of sense. That they're getting smaller, very it's distinguishable. Clearly that one the n plus first term is smaller than its predecessor. That's got to be a convergent series. If the n plus first term is larger, that's a problem. So they're going to diverge. And if they're indistinguishable, we're not going to be able to make a decision. So it's not an end-all kind of test. We're not going to be able to answer every one. Okay, let's go the first example to the harmonic. We know already for three very good reasons that this is divergent. What is the ratio test going to look like? What's the n plus first term? There's the n plus first term. The nth term is 1 over n. I could take the absolute value, but it doesn't have any bearing on these because n, the n values are all positive anyway. So 
So we'll multiply by the reciprocal. What about n over n plus 1 as n approaches infinity? 1, right? 1n over 1n plus 1. This plus 1, as we work our way way out to the right, is going to be pretty insignificant, right? 600 trillion over 600 trillion plus 1. Not a whole lot of difference between the numerator and denominator. So the limit is 1. We already know this diverges, but according to the ratio test, we're right here. It's not distinguishable, the n plus first term and the nth term, way out to the right. So this test wouldn't tell us that it did one or the other, but we already know it diverges. So I guess the reason to do that as an example is you've got to be able to trust the fact that if, the, if it is distinguishable and the limit is less than 1, that would be a convergent series. Okay, first real example. That's kind of a pseudo example. Alternating n cubed over 3 to the n. So when, when would be the situation where we would need to use the ratio test? If it's an infinite geometric series, we don't need to use it. We have a better way. In other words, if we can use a more straightforward way, we would use that. I don't think we have a more straightforward way for an alternating series that has n cubed in the numerator and 3 to the n in the denominator. I don't think we've dealt with anything quite like that before as a certain type of series other than alternating. So the ratio test is going to look like this. I'm going to write this the first time, but you won't need to write this every time. Negative 1 to the n plus 1, n plus 1 cubed, 3 to the n plus 1. Does that look like the n plus first term? Everywhere there was an n, there better be an n plus 1, if I've done this correctly. So there's the n plus first term. We're going to divide it by the nth term, which is normally the way it's handed to us. So what does the absolute value do to the fact that these might be alternating one positive, one negative? I mean, won't that always be the case between two consecutive terms? One will be positive, one will be negative. But doesn't the absolute value more or less take care of that? So we can kind of dispense with those. You don't even need to write those into your problem. See anything numerator and denominator that can reduce? 3 to the n and 3 to the n plus 1 leaves a 3 where? In the bottom, right? This has 3 to 1 higher power than this one. And we've got something cubed and something else cubed. So I'm going to bring that 3 out in the denominator. I'm going to bring that out as a 1 -third. Uh I don't know. I don't know if I like that any better than the other. This one or this one. Not going to change the answer. We look at it this way, n plus 1 over n, 
as n approaches infinity. Eh, I don't like that. And I'll, I'll come back to why I don't like that as well as this one. I'm going to abandon this one. It's true. But as long as we have a finite exponent, we're in business with that. If our exponent is something that is itself increasing and getting larger, that may not be the best way. If n plus 1 were cubed, what would be the first term? I'm, I'm going to scrap that. We could use that, but I'm moving over here. What's the first term of n plus 1 cubed? n cubed? Is everything else of lesser degree? Yes. So we've got some other stuff up here. Not needed. Why is it not needed? Because they won't really matter. This would be the dominant term as n approaches infinity, right? So we've got n cubed plus some stuff of lesser degree. Down here we've got n cubed. So what happens to n cubed plus some stuff of lesser degree divided by n cubed as n approaches infinity? 1, right? That approaches 1. For the same reason that we had earlier, what we have an n plus 1 over n? That was 1n over 1n. Here we've got 1n cubed and 1n cubed. So our answer is 1 third. So do we get a conclusion on this series? Right. So the limit, which was equal to 1 third, is less than 1. So this one converges by the ratio test. This one would work. I just think this might be a little better line of thinking since we've seen things like that in the past. Get the first term, everything else is of lesser degree, n cubed over n cubed, no matter what other stragglers they have with them, that approach is 1. All right, last example. This is kind of cool, actually. It's got some factorials in it. It's got n to the n in it. Not that we do non-cool examples, but they're just not always as cool as this one is. n to the n over n factorial. I don't know if you have an intelligent guess as to whether that converges or diverges. That one's kind of tricky to make a, make a stab at. But let's see what happens with the ratio test. So wherever there's an n, we now want it n plus 1. So there's the n plus first term over the nth term. Don't tell Jacob about that, what I said, for not to tell him. Just kidding. Yeah, that's not just n. I mean, it actually has <laughs> mathematical significance. Um, so we have n plus 1 to the n plus 1. It is always interesting to get that question, you know, what does that mean? So we'll multiply by the reciprocal of the 1 in the bottom. This is why I was hesitant in the previous problem to do n plus 1 over n, put them together when it was cubed, because we do not want to do that here, because it's an unknown exponent. In fact, that becomes the crux of this problem. All right, let's do some simplification in the top and also the bottom. And we've done both of these already. So we've got an n factorial in the numerator. And we've got an n to the n, sorry, 
in the denominator. Let's leave that alone. Let's rewrite this. Isn't that the same thing as n plus 1 times n plus 1 to the n? Is that correct? We did that a few minutes ago. Question, Nicole. Can you rewrite the bottom one with the factorial? Yes. So before we get there, um, everybody okay with that? n plus 1 raised to the n plus 1 is the same thing as n plus 1 times n plus 1 to the n. There's a reason why that becomes beneficial. And Nicole, you were going to rewrite this one as what? Everybody all right with that? So what are the advantages to simplifying that term in the numerator and that term in the denominator? Yes. So n plus 1 over n plus 1. Clearly, that's 1, no matter what n is approaching. n factorial over n factorial. Here's what I think is the cool part of this problem. We've got n plus 1 to the n over n to the n. Since we have them both to the n, we can do the division first and then raise the quotient to the n. Now, the the tendency with this, which I didn't want to develop that mindset in the previous example, is to look at what's inside and say n plus 1 over n as n approaches infinity. The inside piece goes to 1, and then we'd have 1 to the n, which would be 1, which would mean the ra we'd fail on the ratio test. But when this is headed toward infinity, 1 to the infinity may, in fact, not be 1. That's an indeterminate form, 1 to the infinity. So let's break this piece down right here a little bit further. We've done this before, but not in a problem just like this. Let's take everything inside this quotient. And the key issue to this, when would you want to do this? You would only want to do this when the power is getting infinitely large. If it were something cubed, something to the fourth, you're not going to experience the same thing that we're going to experience in this problem by letting it go all the way to, to some infinitely large power. So the n gets divided by n, the 1 gets divided by n, and this n gets divided by n inside the parentheses. So n over n is 1. 1 over n, we're stuck with 1 over n. And in the denominator, we also have n over n. So anything over 1 is just that. Now that's maybe a whole lot like what we started with, but it in, in essence is very different. Does that look familiar? 1 plus 1 over n to the n? I guess not. Something, yeah, one of those, yeah, pi, e, one of those. Let's put in some values. If n is 100, what's 1 plus 1 over 100 raised to the 100th power? Somebody else put in 10,000. What happens to 1 plus 1 over n to the n as n gets infinitely large? You look at that and you say, well, that's just 1 to the n. It isn't, because this is probably, what, 2.70? And this is probably 2.718. I would imagine we're getting pretty darn close. Pretty darn close to what? E. <coughs> So that's one of the definitions of E, or one of those numbers, right? 
In this case, it's E. So there's our conclusion. Not really our conclusion, but it's going to help us with our conclusion. If the limit is E, what's our conclusion about this? It diverges. It diverges. Because what? The limit was larger than 1, right? It's kind of a unique problem that we end up with n plus 1 over n raised to the n. And everything tells us that that's 1. But if we really analyze what happens to that, it isn't 1. It's the value e. So e larger than 1, the limit is greater than 1. Therefore, the series diverges. Uh, let me make sure that I'm not leaving anything out here. This is kind of some interesting wording. I guess we should look at it before we leave it. So back to the absolute convergence. By definition, a series is absolutely convergent. This is in the book. If the series of absolute values of that series is convergent. So basically, if the positively termed series is convergent, so is its alternating series companion. The series A sub n is absolutely convergent. That, that actually just kind of sounds funny. If it's absolutely convergent, then it is convergent. Right? So why, wh why would that be stated? If a series is absolutely convergent, then it is convergent. It referring to possibly the alternating version. If it's convergent absolutely in its positively termed series, we don't even need to examine the alternating series. So if it's absolutely convergent, certainly it's convergent. Both of them are, positive and negative versions. Glad we looked at that. Here's the ratio test. Let's make sure that we came up with the same conclusion. We take the limit of the absolute value of the n plus first term divided by its predecessor way out to the right. We get a number, hopefully, L. If L is less than 1, then that series is absolutely convergent. I guess we didn't throw that word in. Probably should, because what did we do? We did away with the alternating part, and we looked at just the positively termed series because of that. So if the positively term series is convergent, so is its alternating counterpart. So we can throw that word in, absolutely convergent. If we get an answer that is greater than 1, certainly infinity is greater than 1, then the series is divergent. So they don't even mention what happens when L is 1. So in other words, there's no conclusion. Absolutely no conclusion. Let's, let's add that in. We're absolute in that decision. Okay, we have five minutes left, but I'm not going to start Power Series, um, which is Section 8.5, with five minutes remaining. So let's start 8.5 tomorrow. Um, Web assign. When do we have web assigns due? Two days? Okay, so tomorrow would be a good day probably if you have web assigned questions since we're meeting tomorrow and not meeting Thursday.